Good morning again, everybody. My name is Joel Dorman. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, today's a little different, as we've been saying. We're, we're inside instead of out on the lawn. We continue to pray uh, just for all those uh, the great folks battling these wildfires that uh, they get it under control for the sake of getting it under control, but also uh, locally, we reap the benefit of being able to be back outside. So we can't wait to see you, hopefully, Lord willing, next week when we're together again out on the lawn or maybe in our drive-in section, and for some of you joining us online next week. We're going to welcome you just as much then as well, but glad you're with us as uh, we get started this morning with the message, and hopefully you've got your communion supplies together. You're going to need those at the end of the service today, so you still have a few minutes. If you cut away right now to go grab them, I'm never going to know because I can't see you, Uh, so if you do that, you just do that, and uh, it'll be our little secret, I guess. I want to ask you, though, uh, whether you're running to the kitchen to get those supplies now or you're still watching it, uh, what do you think about work? What do you think about work? And we've covered a lot of ground in this series. And it seems appropriate that I ask you, what do you think about work? And we started off talking about how God uh, made work. He said work was a good thing. He said it was a very good thing. He created it before anything else happened in the world. And then we talked about what happened when sin entered the equation and all of a sudden work became labor and it became a toil and it became difficult, it became challenging. And then last week we talked about what happened also whenever uh, work gets out of hand and we become workaholics and we begin, to work, uh, we begin to find our identity in work. So what do you think about work? What do you think about work now? It's one thing to say intellectually that God made work, that God created it. It's another thing to actually believe God is going to use your work to do something for His glory. Every now and again, I like to admit my bias. My bias is as a disciple of Jesus and as a pastor, I'm coming at this from a biblical point of view. My worldview is shaped by Scripture. And but the Bible teaches us that everything we do as Christians is for His glory. And that means work. That's what we've been talking about. But do you really think God is going to use your work for His glory? What do you think about that kind of work? That's what we're talking about today as we conclude our message series, Don't Waste Your Work. We're talking about your work for others and how not just that you're working for others in an employee sense, but that we're actually working for the glory of God for others and that there's always this other concept going on in our work. We're in the book of Jeremiah today, Jeremiah chapter 29. Old Testament book of Jeremiah, words will be on the screen if you need them. You can look it up on your phone, grab a print Bible if they're close to you, wherever you are. Uh, But Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 7. And I'm going to read the passage, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about why this is so significant, not only in the life of the Jewish people, but in our lives today. This is what we read. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, verse 4 is when the Lord is giving a message to exiles. It is around 587 B.C. when uh, the Lord allowed the Babylonians to come in and finally defeat Jerusalem. And, they, and what the Babylonians would do is they would carry uh, the captives from their, uh, their conquered enemies. They would deport them, and they'd carry them somewhere in the Babylonian Empire. It's how they would integrate them into their culture. So the Jewish people had been taken from the land of Judah and the Jerusalem area, and they'd been moved to Babylon. Now, this happened not just because God suddenly fell asleep on the job and he he accidentally let Babylon slip in. No, no. This was the result of decades, no, centuries of disobedience where God sent prophet after prophet after prophet and warned them, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, I will punish you. I will kick you out of the land. 
what we're reading and what I'm telling you is this is what God did. He, he made good on this. He said, if you do this, I will punish you. Now he's punished them. Now they're remorseful. Kind of like a kid when we get caught and we get in trouble, now we feel bad. Well, now they feel bad. Now they, they, they're hoping for some uh, great news to come out of the prophet, but this is what he says. Instead, what he tells them in these next few verses, the message is the Lord's people are to settle in and to settle down in this, in this land. Where they are, they're to settle in and to settle down. This was not what they wanted to hear. This was not the message they were hoping for. But, but what the prophet tells them is, settle in. In other words, get married, have children, raise a family, let them have children, get yourself some grandkids, build businesses. He said, you know, plant farms, eat what they produce, be industrious, make a home. Now, see, they were hoping that they were only going to be there a few days, a few weeks. Maybe the Lord would do something amazing and take them back, maybe even that day. But in other places, the prophet Jeremiah had already told them this was going to last about 70 years which meant that the people that were carried out of Jerusalem and out of of Judah into Babylon, they were going to die there. And so the Lord says, settle in, settle down, make a home. You're going to be there a while. But that's not even the hardest part. The hardest part is actually the last verse there. When the Lord tells his people to bless their, their enemy, to bless the society where they are by their work. The Babylonians were their enemy. These were not the good guys. The good guys were the ones, you know, if you're looking good guy, bad guy in the story, the good guys were the ones who had been carted off. They were the ones now who were in captivity, and they're supposed to pray and bless their enemies who had just conquered them, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and taken them away from their homes and killed a lot of people in the process. That's the hardest part. Look again at verse 7. This is what he tells them. This is the tail end of this thing. He says, also, seek the peace and prosperity, the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile, just in case they forgot that it was the Lord doing this. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So the Lord's people were to bless Babylon By their industriousness, their work, their lives were to bless this nation that had conquered them, their enemies, certainly not their people. And they were to bless that. And the Lord said, you will be a blessing to them. And he says, if the city prospers, if the nation prospers, you too will prosper. Now, as hard as that would be to hear, that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, that's a logical expression, and the Lord is logical. I mean, we would never get on a plane and and be flying somewhere across this incredible country and pray that the pilot is having a bad day. We know that if the pilot of the plane prospers, we're going to land safely. That's all he's saying. Pray for the pilot of the plane. Because after all, if they get to your destination safely, you're safe. But it's a lot harder to say when it's something you didn't choose. We, 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 We may have chosen to get on a plane, but they didn't choose this. And yet the Lord says, bless where you are. Prosper where you are, and it will prosper them. You see, that means even for us as Christians today, we are to pray for the peace and prosperity of where we are. Now, as Christians, as people who are disciples of Jesus, people whose souls long to be in heaven, this world is in our home. I may be a resident of Merced, California, United States of America in the year 2020, but that is not my home. That is where I live, but it is not my home. My home is heaven. That's where my home is. And yet God is telling me, while I'm here, I am to pray for the peace and prosperity of where I am and to bless it and to do good by it and to do good for it. You know, one of the most difficult um, lasting consequences of the shutdowns that happened in March through the I guess it kind of was middle of May when it kind of started opening back up, late May, was the economic fallout. Now, we're not strangers to our county. We know our county. We're in one of the poorest counties in the, in the state. And because of that, we feel the impact economically quicker and longer than the rest of the state. So what do we do as Christians? Do we sit back and say, well, that's just too bad. People are hurting. Not at all. 
This is our opportunity to step up and pray for the peace and prosperity and to put feet to that prosperity. It's why we have a compassion fund at all. People find themselves without jobs. They need help. What can we do? We can help them. It's why people can give to food banks. It's why people can give uh, to help others. It's why we can band together. This is the moment when Christians can shine the most. But it takes us being willing to bless society by our work. It takes us being willing to step out and say, I will do what is best for my area. It's one of the, the reasons that I feel as Christians it is sinful for us to not vote. Because we have such a unique opportunity in our country that our Constitution even begins with the declaration of we the people. That our job is to invest into our communities and invest into our government. And so we have to vote. And we have to, that's part of how we act out the prosperity and to do the things that are helpful to our city and to our state and to our country. This is part of what we do. It's why we as a congregation will say we're not just in Merced. We are for Merced. We are on Merced's side. We are cheering it on. We are engaged in local politics. We are engaged with the city council. We are engaged with the school boards. Why? Because we want what is best for our city. That is what the Lord is telling us, that our work, how we contribute, how we get involved with this makes a difference. You see, our work blesses the Lord. It blesses our communities. And yes, it blesses ourselves. It does bless us too. Of course it does. It's just that's not the primary reason we as Christians engage in work. The priority the Lord gives us is that we are to bless the Lord, our communities, and ourselves. Now, N.T. Wright, who is a theologian and pastor, wrote this incredible book I highly recommend it. It's called Surprised by Hope. And he writes this. He says, The created order which God has begun to redeem in the resurrection of Jesus is a world in which heaven and earth are not designed to be separated, but to come together. And in that coming together, the very good that God spoke over all creation at the beginning will be enhanced, not abolished. Which means we are collaborators with the Lord, bringing about renewal to our communities through our work. Because our work blesses the Lord. It blesses our communities. And yes, it blesses ourselves. That is part of the equation. It's why we pray for our city. It's why we pray for those things going on. We are not, we are not disassociated with what is happening. We're not disconnected from what's going on. Quite the contrary, we are directly involved with it. Our work makes a difference. And I don't mean that just even in a financial sense. That's part of it. But even in terms of taxes, I mean, how our, where our taxes go, that's part of it. I mean, Jesus talked about that too. But we, we do this and we bless where we are. We, we, we pray for the peace and the prosperity of where we find ourselves. We, we bloom where we are planted. And we are planted here. And so our work is there to bless the Lord, our communities, and ourselves. That means we have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to change your part of the world through your work. Now again, I said at the beginning, it's one thing to say, yes, the Lord created work. Yes, I can have a better attitude at work. That, that's one thing, and that's a good thing. It's a whole other thing to make the full transition into saying, I believe the Lord is going to use me in my work to bless others for His glory. That's a whole different can of worms. That's a whole different setting. But that's what we have to wrestle with. It's easy for us to think of certain jobs and certain work and certain positions as, as being more important or, or as being more uh, operative to the kingdom or, or, dare I even say the word, maybe even more essential. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, even practically, if you think about this, realize that the construction worker built the road that the ambulance drives on that takes someone to the hospital. The engineer and technician and factory worker builds the MRI machine that the specialist can look into our bodies and figure out what's going on. Uh, the bookkeeper, uh, the, the, the CFO of the organization balances the books of the business so people can get paid and so they can pay their bills and provide for their families. 
And see, in the sovereignty of God, he's saying all these things are connected. And as, 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 as the, the place where we live prospers, as we seek its peace and prosperity, we are blessed in the process. But we're doing that through the purpose of blessing other people. Change your part of the world through your work. Which means first you've got to look at seizing an opportunity. That means you've got to find somewhere that you can be Jesus in that setting. Now, you could stand up on the corner of your desk and, and, and preach a sermon. It's probably not the most effective methodology, but you could do that. I mean, I don't even do that here, and I work in a church office, but you could. But maybe there's another chance. Maybe it's just the, the living out of your faith in, in maybe less <laughs> obvious ways to where when a coworker needs prayer, they know you're the one they can go to. It's just seizing an opportunity. It's, it's the little things we do. You know, don't you find that oftentimes it's the little things that add up to be a big thing? See, that's, that's our witness in front of others. That's, that's how we can live for Jesus in front of others and not only redeem work, but redeem our work for the glory of God. So seize an opportunity. But, but also celebrate work. Now, notice I put quotes around work. I know that just because we do a message series about work doesn't suddenly make your workplace a happy place. You may hate your job. We've talked about that nearly every week. There's a reason for that. Sin entered the equation, and it messed up everything. Message number two of the series. I'm not saying it's going to make your work better. However, the concept of work is something God made. He made work. Work existed before sin came in and messed it all up, which means Work is going to be around even after Jesus returns and he sets it all right again. See, we're not going to spend eternity sitting on clouds strumming on harps. We're going to be working. Now, I don't know what that work looks like because, quite honestly, I can't imagine work without the toil and the labor and the difficulty. You probably can't either. But we can celebrate the fact that, like all of God's creation, work was designed to be perfect. That work is something we're grateful for, that we're thankful that God has given us an opportunity not only to earn an income and to make a living, but to actually use that to help others, that it's not just about us, that, that our work becomes a gift that we can give others. We can give our families, our friends. We can help people when they hit hard times. Why? Because we have work. We can help others find work. Why? Because work is a noble thing. Message number one, we talked about that. So we can celebrate the idea that work is another part of God's creation that he made that is, that is beautiful. Yes, tainted by sin, everything is. But we celebrate the fact that God made it and we get a chance to redeem it for his glory. Which means even if you hate your job, you still have a chance to do something there for the glory of God. Which means even that job you hate, even that job that is so frustrating, has purpose and has meaning in the eyes of God. But also, you need to understand that fundamentally, everything that I have said in this message and everything we have said in the last three is predicated on one idea. Its foundation is on one idea, and that is this, that you are a disciple of Jesus, that you have committed your life to Jesus, that you are a Christian, not a church person. I don't mean that I have no desire to make you into a church person. I'm not trying to make you religious. I don't consider myself religious, and I'm not trying to make you religious. I am, however, talking to disciples of Jesus who are working out their salvation, committing their life to Jesus, and figuring out what it means to be Christian in a world that is hostile and even toxic to our faith. You think the smoke is bad, just pay attention to the spiritual attacks we go through. It's rough. So I'm talking to those people, and if that's not you, you can go through all the attitude change you want, and you can take some of the principles that we've talked about in this series, and they'll work. I mean, it's God's wisdom, and God's wisdom is going to work whether you're a Christian or not. But ultimately, you'll be rearranging chairs on a sinking ship if you've not actually committed your life to Jesus. So your work for others is designed to bring glory to God. And you can only bring glory to God when you're actually one of His, when you've committed your life to Him. And so today, for some of you watching this, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day that you cross that line and you stop working for yourself, you stop living for yourself, and you start working and living for Him. And I'm so excited to be able to introduce you to that process, those steps. 
And it's not, I don't even mean, kind of shudder to even say the word steps. You see, it's not like a program that you step through. It's just the idea is that you're committing yourself to Him. And so I just want to lead you in a prayer wherever you're at, wherever you're watching this or listening to this. I just want to lead you in a prayer. And it doesn't even matter if you get all my words right. I talk kind of funny sometimes because I'm originally from Texas and I speak kind of half Texan, half Californian. So I use some weird phrases sometimes. But just the idea here is that you're praying from your heart, your words. But I'm just going to give you a model to follow, okay? So you can pray a prayer and commit your life to Jesus right there where you are. Just pray like this. Say, Dear Jesus, I admit that I've been working and living my life for me and only me. And I admit that I know that's a sinful attitude. And that sin means that I've done something against you. But I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died for me. I believe that he rose from the dead for me, just like we sang earlier. And today, as best as I understand, I'm committing my life to you. My work, my hobbies, my bank account, my attitude, my life. Thank you for receiving me, making me your child. Amen. Now, the Bible says if you prayed something like that in faith, that, you, that you're, you prayed that from your heart, the Bible says you're a new creation, that you're not the person you were just 30 seconds ago, but you're a brand new person in Jesus. And we want to know about it. If we were together in person, we'd be applauding and cheering that. Next week, we'd hang a balloon up to show, to show everybody about this party that you kicked off in heaven. But we still want to know. Okay, click the link uh, for a digital connection card. Go to our website and complete one. Send us a smoke signal through all the smoke. Uh, send us an email, something. Let us know you prayed that prayer, that you took those initial steps. And, and we want to we send you some information, get you started on the next steps in that process. You see, you see, leading people to Jesus and walking with them through the journey, that's our work as a church. That's what we do. That's how we bring glory to God. That's our work. And so we want, to know, we want to know that we're working well, and we want to know that we've actually worked for you. And so the way we know that is you've got to tell us that. And next week, if you send us that this week, next week you, you'll see a balloon wherever we're meeting. If it's in here because it's still smoky, you'll see a balloon just off to my left or right. If we're outside, you'll see a little balloon tied to the stage, and that'll be representing you, the celebration of you and that you committed your life to Jesus. Because that's why we're here. Your work. My work, our work, blesses the Lord, it blesses our communities, yeah, it blesses ourselves too. And our work as disciples of Jesus, as those who are His kids walking in His favor, our work for others is to bring others just one step closer to Jesus. I'm going to say a quick prayer of blessing, and then we're going to uh, prepare ourselves for communion. So if those supplies are close to you, get them a little closer, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that you have counted us worthy to be your kids, not because of us, but because of you. Bless this time of communion. May we recognize the incredible price that was paid for us to work for you. In Jesus' name, amen.